Today we're visiting with Michael and Colleen Histon at Shepherd's Manor Creamery, a sheep dairy here in New Windsor, Maryland. year of cheese making. First year was really a tester year. We only milked for mm, three and a half months. Uh, left the lambs with the mothers for three about months. three months three because months. we were still building the dairy. We did not get our, we started milking May 15th. We did not actually have our license to produce farmstead cheese until August 6th. So therefore we were not allowed to sell anything that was produced in those couple of months. And it was a really small amount because the lambs being with the mothers that length of time they weren't producing a lot of milk by the time we started milking. So we were getting under a pound a day, you know, from the lambs, uh, from the mothers. So um, I probably made maybe 100 wheels that were sellable of that, maybe 75 to 100 that first year. I didn't really have a market, so uh, it was fine. You know, it was more of a tester, like I said, to try it out. So now today, uh, last year we had our first full year of milking, and I, again, so it was not marketing. Everything came uh, gradually in time. So I started uh, finding markets back last winter, and we had about 400 wheels to sell last year. Uh, we still, still have some of that actually today, some of my harder cheese. Um, we uh, now today have had this first full, really full year of milking and cheese making. I made over 800 meals this year. I have three different varieties of hard cheese that are all raw milk aged cheeses. And then I have a fresh pasteurized milk cheese that I produce uh, when, during the season uh, when we are milking. We milk until the mid-September timeframe and we are now uh, breeding again and they'll have a five month gestation and we'll start landing mid-February and probably again keep the lambs with the mothers for 30 days that's the easiest way for us to do it uh, and then start milking probably around mid-March and start all over and I am in three farmers markets actually four three weekly farmers markets and one that goes uh, once a month that will end in December one of the markets I'll keep through uh, the winter and the others will dissipate. One has already stopped and the other one will stop mid-December. So, and then there are other places where our cheese is. That currently I have it. a couple wineries. We have uh, an on-farm store in Mount Airy. I have a co-op down in Tacoma Park. We have a restaurant in Baltimore and I have a restaurant in DC. So slowly uh, branching out and finding different markets <coughs> to uh, take the cheese to. So growing slowly. Well, what we did is uh, our children were in 4-H. Uh, our daughter liked the sheep and our son liked the steers and, and the cows, and they went their separate ways. Uh, the kids went on to college, and then uh, Colleen and I felt that um, we sort of missed the camaraderie of the other people at the shows. So with our daughter in college, Colleen asked our daughter if uh, she would show Colleen how to fit and show sheep. So then we started doing some open shows at the state fair and some counties like Montgomery County and, and Howard County. And then we went out to California. Her sister is a wine marketing manager. We, we met a cheesemonger there and we got discussing with him about sheep cheese and I didn't know much about it. I didn't know anything about dairy sheep. Went to our extension agent at the time, which was David Green, asked him about that and he gave me a wealth of information. We, I just sort of put it on the side burner to be honest and then two years later we went back out there and the cheesemonger saw us again and wondered if I got rid of our meat sheep and got dairy sheep and then he gave me six slices of tome it was all off the same farm all six slices of that tome cheese had six different flavors to it because in that state of Washington they have such wide ranges from droughts to almost typhoon type of weather the, the sheep pick up the flavors and minerals from the ground and from the grass and that affects the cheese flavor and that's sort of what got us hooked. Hmm. And we came back and started doing research and looking into it. We went and started visiting farms 
and uh, seeing really what was out there. Finding out that there are only 120 to 140 sheep dairies in the United States. Uh, there is a large call for it. Most of the cheese is imported from Europe, and uh, and there's no uh, right, and there's no tariffs on the cheese that comes in. Goat cheese and uh, bovine cheeses have tariffs on them when they come into the states. Sheep's cheese, because there's no uh, large conglomeration of sheep dairies, there is no tariff on it, and that's why, it, in perspective, it's cheaper than ours because their government subsidizes it and. So we felt there was a big market with all the wineries around here, and we would be on the cutting edge. We've been in a lot of different businesses throughout our life together, and they've all been very competitive businesses. So this is something that we thought, well, this is not going to be as competitive. You know, and it, it brings into mind agriculture, which we both love, uh, animal husbandry, which we both love, and my cooking, which, you know, I have a... a a talent. An edge for uh, doing cooking and parties and uh, gourmet meals. So it just would bring all of those things together without me having to become a chef to do those things. So, so how long would you say the planning phase was? Uh, gee, uh, 2006, unbeknownst to me, you know, when we first went out to California mm -hmm. and he started thinking about it, we really started really talking about it. Or 2004, I guess. Right, we went four. back in 2006. It was the second time, and that's when we really started talking about it. We didn't really start looking at dairies until 2008, so uh, we bought sheep right away, and it took us until the first cheese that I made was 2011. So, five years, right. probably. So in the meantime, when you were planning and researching, what were you doing for an income source? At, at, at the time, both work full right. Okay. We uh, both had off the job, off the farm jobs. So. Yes. Okay. Well, that's, that's pretty standard. Yes. Right. 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 So tell me a little bit with she, with sheep dairy, a little about about facilities and equipment sourcing that. Uh, actually, that goes from extremely easy to find, which is brand new and expensive, to sort of hard because uh, the older stuff is hard to find. Uh, some of the bigger equipment, like the bulk tanks, are sort of easy to find because some of the bigger dairies don't want the smaller tanks. We can't afford, uh, space-wise, to have a 600-gallon tank or an 800-gallon tank because we could never fill it and the milk wouldn't be uh, stored correctly. So most of the stuff is older. Um, and uh, some of the big manufacturers still make this stuff for over in uh, Europe. So it, we went to two separate farms. Yeah, we, when we decided to do this, we became aggressive, aggressively looking. Uh, and we did it in a very short time frame from buying sheep, which we were still on the other property that we lived on, only two and a half acres, to then looking for equipment. And we found first equipment in Pennsylvania, and we went and looked at it, and then we decided to buy it. We had to go disassemble it. We had to have ways to get it, you know, and we spent a day uh, getting it, bringing it back, and then storing it. And then the second group came uh, a month later, and that was in Vermont, and we went up and looked at that, and then we ended up saying, okay, we're going to buy this too. So we, both, we got the best of both, and then we sold off some of the stuff from the first one that was cow dairy, uh, and the equipment was too big. We had an 800-gallon vat, like Michael said, and um, we had a big transfer tank, a oh, the transfer gallon. milk right. tank, if we were going from farm to farm, which we had no use for either. So, but there were other things in that package that were worthwhile, and we looked at the value of what we were getting and uh, what, we could, what we didn't need, and we took, you know, we ended up using what we we wanted from that that worked. They had a, a vacuum pack machine, they had a weight scale, many bread racks, uh, trays, uh, tables, sinks, three compartment sinks, so all of those things came in this package. Second group uh, gave us smaller scale equipment, a small bulk tank, smaller two-part sinks, uh, smaller tables, a press that was handmade, uh, a vat to make the cheese in, it was a kettle actually, a so a soup kettle. So all of those things were of value as well. And uh, I, I'm, I'm glad we got both sets, of pat, even though we could have done with just the second, but we still would have had things we were missing that we got out of the first that we really needed. So by combining the two packages, we had really everything we needed. But it all sat in trailers or in storage for a while, for a couple of years, you know, so. 
So how does someone who's looking for unique equipment, how did you research and find this? Uh, for, like everybody else, first thing you do is you hit the internet. Um, always be very skeptical. What we found out is a lot of stuff comes from overseas and be very, very skeptical of that metal. Uh, the second thing we do is hit the good old Lancaster Farmer mm -hmm. uh, and you start networking. You, you might call one person that has one part and it's sort of like American Pickers. That person knows another person and they give you their phone number or email address and, and it's a very enjoyable hunt. And, you know, and some of the stuff you look at, you sort of scratch your head and say, no, thank you very much. I really appreciate you, know, you offering it to sell to us, but it doesn't fit our build or the quality wasn't there. Um, everything has to be inspected by milk control, uh, which is a whole separate show in itself, and that is really critical. And you have to be able to to uh, make sure that those pieces of equipment meet their specifications. It was just like with the sheep. Uh, we went, we knew the source of where the most sheep were, and that was the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival, from having many years of being there. So we we went in 2008 uh, with the aspiration of finding somebody who was uh, producing sheep smoked cheese. We knew there was someone there. We went and we introduced ourselves to her. We ended up going to her farm two weeks later, looked at her sheep. We ended up buying some, just 14 uh, ewes and one ram. We knew that really wasn't enough to start with. So then we went on to, I started doing Google searches for other sheep dairy in the United States. And I emailed 10 or 12 farms. I had the first one that responded back to me was in Wisconsin. They were very nice. And we ended up we're driving up there. So that whole summer between buying equipment and, and looking at dairies and look, looking at sheep, every time we turned around it was just another road trip to go somewhere. But we didn't mind because we were aggressively seeking our bottom line of what we needed to do to do this business. So what do you think was the most positive asset you had in the, in the planning and then bringing this enterprise to fruition? I think the most positive thing is, is our tenacity and the love of it. I, it it's, it's, a, it's a odd ball combination. You, you have to have self-drive, you have to have a pride in what you're doing, you have to have a pride in what you're manufacturing and, and it's an endless drive you have to have because every day is a new challenge. Every day, and people don't understand that. My advice to someone is, if they're doing it, go work for someone as an intern or volunteer, three days a week, and get a taste of it. Because ninety percent of the people that say, "Oh, this is great," and they come here and they work with us, they're pooped out, and they—that's that's the end. The re reality of how hard it is comes to them. There are people that have approached us um, that well at, at Sheep and Wolf the first year, people approached me. Uh, oh my. My son's in college. He wants to get into this kind of business. What? How, do you, how does he go about it? What does he need to do? You know, and I don't even think they had had any experience with sheep. I mean, that's really the first thing. If you have never, I mean, we we had that asset that we had spent 20 years with 4-H people and being around agriculture and being around animal husbandry. So we already knew that part of it. If you've never been around animals and you've never learned how to, that you have to get up, you have to go outside every day, it can be 20 degrees, it can be pouring down rain, you're going to get soaking wet, you're going to be really cold, frostbitten hands, frostbitten feet. If you're not willing to do that, then you shouldn't even be considering this business because you have to be able to do that first. Correct. Sounds kind of daunting, and I, I guess that brings to my next question. You're working with dairy products, which are probably the most regulated food products that that farmers can can produce. produce. Uh, Sorry. Obviously, you've had you've had some uh, challenges and some obstacles. I don't want to cede that that the regulations are the biggest obstacle, but could you share a little bit about the process of being licensed and selling dairy products here in Maryland? Correct. Uh, what we have to do is, you, <clears throat> the first thing you have to do is make sure you have the correct zoning for your location. Even though it, it says it's agricultural, you have to get the approval from the zoning board at, at your county or, and or province um, where you're at to make sure that's legal. Because in certain cases, a couple properties we looked at, it wasn't allowed. 
So this property was on the borderline between being allowed and not being allowed. We had to go for a zoning exemption for the processing plant. You can milk the sheep, but you can't process here. So we had to get a zoning exemption. That takes time and money. Then the next thing we had, we had to do was get the approval from the building codes department about how we wanted to build the building. Then once that was approved, then we had to go back to milk control and get them to approve what the, what the building permit people approved. And there was a little bit of tension there because we, uh, we are an, an oddity because we're the first one we're like the Coast Guard icebreaker going through the frozen lake up in Nova Scotia. You know, we, we are, we're cutting edge. So, so we realized we were going to be fighting an uphill battle a little bit with a lot of skepticism. However, we were lucky enough, the University of Wisconsin Spooner has a research center. And at the time, uh, the University of Vermont had a cheese institute. And they were more than able to give us lots of documentation to back up our thoughts. pretty extensive. Uh, your financial planning? How did that work out? If you had told us in retrospect today what it would cost to have done this, I would have said, well, we won't even try because there is absolutely no way we have that kind of right. money. We both worked normal, not hugely paid jobs. We have normal income, actually probably lower than a lot of people. Uh, as of today, my children make more than I. My children make more money than Michael and I combined, the two of us. So that's really <laughs> amazing, you know. Um, so what happened was uh, we first off made it a woman-owned business. I mean, so that helped with some in some respects. That was my business, and and that was really, you know, what it was going to be anyway. It was meant to be that it would be my undertaking. Um, and then I went to several agencies. We, we joined Future Harvest. Future Harvest is an organization in this region, uh, more, I think, more for producers of, uh, vegetables. of vegetables than it is for someone like us. But we went to it the first year, and I met someone through Marbitco. Marbitco is a Maryland agricultural uh, enterprise where we you know, are able to you know, get funds. We ended up going to farm credit first off right away, and he was very uh, funny. Uh, he was very understanding and very willing to work with us, but That's also skeptical, skeptical um, because no one had done this. They had no background to look at. They, they had no history to see whether or not this was possible to work. And with so many cow dairies having so many issues over the last several years, um, I, I was actually amazed at how easygoing he was about working with us. And, and, one, and one of the reasons why they were so uh, easygoing slash impressed by us is because we took the advantage of, we took all the information from Spooner, Wisconsin, and, <clears throat> and from their agriculture department, and from uh, the University of Vermont, and we also enlisted help from other friends that have either written grants or read grants and or deal with political systems in the state or federal agencies and said, look, we need to put a, a plan together that would impress someone. So it doesn't look like we just sat there and wrote this on two nap napkins at a restaurant. And, and that was the critical part. And we had to follow through. So not only did we hand them that, those documents, but we said the following pages have, have been completed. P pages, you know, 8, 10, 12, 15. Those items have been 100% completed and were already launched. So, 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 that, so that made them, to a loan agency, look like we know what we're doing, which we did, and we still do, and we, and, and, and we are aggressively getting the, the, the other parts of this. We had a bank that was trying to woo us, and at the very last minute, they withdrew because they decided they weren't getting out of any agricultural backing at all, and that sort of took us by surprise. Um, very well-known bank. But then we decided to go to Farm Credit, who, who we had never dealt with at the time, and now we have a very good relationship between them and Marbitco. And I have a financial background. That's what I've been doing for many years, and I've always done our own taxes. And I put together a business plan, which is what I presented to each one of these organizations uh, of what I expected that we would be doing. And between the business plan and the fact that we had very stable uh, economic situation with us personally and our uh, and, and how we've dealt with our money through the years. Our house was almost paid off, you know. Uh, we didn't have any real debt to speak of, and we 
showed that we could manage money and, and what we had. I think that all of that played in our favor uh, to make it work. Right. So they were willing to work with us. Right. And, and, and because this is such a new en entity, they were very skeptical of it, but what we did was we showed them throughout the country what, what, what was occurring, what was our potential. Well, you're also saying that now you're full-time here? I am, yes. Oftentimes it's difficult for producers to make that decision of when do you launch out and give up the day job, right? Can you it was, I probably would not have at the time, uh, I spend almost a year now, uh, to a couple days, it'll be a year. I probably would have stayed until I killed myself to stay in my job because I, there's never ever going to feel like there's enough money. You know, you're never going to feel like you're on easy street, you know, so I always felt we needed that. But I also knew at some point in time, if I was ever going to really make this work, I was going to have to quit. And I would have never been able to market like I've been able to market this year. I mean, that was another whole full-time job in itself, just doing marketing. And I needed to sell that cheese, but I wasn't, I wasn't looking at that part yet. So it came right at the right time for me to end up leaving my position, and we have survived and made it work over this past year, and it will continue in baby steps to survive, as long as we don't, you know, go too crazy with spending, and we take things slowly, you know, little by little. Our challenge this next year is bringing in some people, a little bit more hours to relieve me to do other things that are more important. I've still been milking. I like the milking because I like to still be involved in that, but really, it isn't where I should be. I should be just concentrating on cheese making and marketing. And when one of our girls, so we've had interns, uh, high schoolers, one of them we taught this year to be able to go to the farmer's market. So like this past week when we were gone, I still, I didn't have to give up the three farmer's markets I had. I was able to have her go. And that's the kind of steps that we need to now make is, is transitioning to having more people doing the milking, more people relieving Michael so he can do other farm related items and more people relieving me so that I can be a better cheese maker and be a better entrepreneur out there selling my product. facilities did you need to build on this farm? Uh, first thing you have to do is, uh, we'll start backwards, is uh, you had to have a manure management plan and a manure con confinement device. We have a pit with a ramp in it, which is sort of odd for this area, but because sheep poo is a little different than normal poo. Uh, <laughs> then uh, we had to have a standardized um, milking rack or, or, or parlor. Uh, we chose a, a raised one because for many different reasons. Uh, then we have to have a standard milk room or, or, or milk house as they maybe put it on the blueprints even though it's a room. Then we have a cheese processing plant slash cheese room. Then my wife has a nice aging room or affamage room. Some people call it a cave. And then we have uh, an office slash shipping area. And we had to have uh, an airlock between some of the rooms so we just chose to have the whole length you know, of, of all of those rooms access through an airlock so that bugs can't get into the rooms. We have to have uh, a repellent above each doorway so that any bugs mm -hmm. that are attempting to get in, flies or whatnot, yeah. uh, right. generally will go into this sticky trap, trap instead of uh, right. coming into the room. And then, and then the whole building has to be air pressurized. So if you open the door and if there's a fly there, it blows the fly away. Instead of letting it come in. Right. So, and we have to wear certain Garb. Uh, garb to go into the two of the rooms in the alphanage room. I'm the only one that goes in that room. No one else goes in there. And certain uh, garb to go into my cheese making room. So we don't just let anyone in. They can peek in the door. We have a water uh, sanitation uh, foot bath. Foot bath, yeah. That's in front of each one of those doors. I wear certain boots when I go in that room. I put on a hairnet whenever I'm working with the cheese. And we, I also wear an apron. So. Um, and Michael has boots too to go into that room. So he and I are the only ones that go in the cheese room generally, and I'm the only one that goes in the off and off room. Yeah. As you look back, if there was anything that you would do different uh, to get to where you are today? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and this is going to be a two different okay. part. All right. part so two the first there. thing I'll say to that is that we had background with sheep. So we already knew what it took to take care of sheep. If someone came into the business and they had never done that, that would be my first recommendation to somebody, that you need to have the animal first. You need to take care of the animal. You need to know that you can handle that. But for us, we already had done that. But we instead, that's what we did first. We went and bought sheep. I would not have done that uh, first. I would have gotten everything set up. Um, I, for some reason, I think we were both feeling that we needed to build this flock. We needed to have this huge flock first, and then we could start milking, instead of having everything in place, and then going and buying sheep. The sheep were out there. But at the time, it didn't seem like the sheep were out there. We thought they were really scarce. So anybody that had them, we wanted to go and get them, because we didn't really think they were available. But they are. So, and then the second thing is, we looked, it was during one of the worst economic times for buying a house you know, in 2008. Prices were high. Um, our house had more value at the time that we moved out of than it does than it did when we, once we ended up selling it. But we looked and looked and looked. And we had come to this particular property several times and really had never gotten into the house. And I, at the time, I always wanted a house that was on the road. And then I realized, well, maybe it's better that we don't have a house on the road because uh, we need to have some privacy so that we are are able to take care of these this business without bothering anyone, without getting in anyone's way. So it was it was for that reason that we basically chose coming down this lane. But today, one of the things that I definitely would do different, and we've both talked about this several times, is we would prefer to have a house that was right on the road because we could then look at possibly having a, a store, an on you know a farm store, which you know we can't really have down here. Um, it's not. We, we really have to to be okay with the, you know, have the neighbors be okay with us doing that. And we really don't want to bother people by doing that and having people coming up and down the lane. So it would be, in retrospect, it would have been better had we been right on the road, I think, as well. And to, to piggyback onto her, her, her answer, uh, I would have um, uh, been more aggressive to fight some of the regulations because right now where the way the dairy is built and we'll, between the regulations of uh, the health department, uh, I, we can't expand e that building at all. So we're locked in on a size. And what we found out through the School of Hard Knocks is a, a number is about 300 to milk uh, to really be extremely viable. From there up is when it's a true producing farm that you don't need any outside income. So right now we're sort of uh, locked in through some regulations that will probably never get any bigger than 100 here. So, yeah, that's best for you. So what keeps you passionate about doing this? It sounds like a lot of financial burden, lots of work. <laughs> <laughs> what keeps you turned on? I, I, well, I'll, I'll go first. I, it just, it's very impressive to have someone come, come here and see everything and enjoy it. It's just, I, I can't describe it. It, it, it. And I can't describe when someone drives out and they bought a wheel of your, your, your cheese or our cheese. And it's just, it, it's, a, it's a feeling you can't describe. And it's a very positive thing. And everything we've done is in a positive sort. And there's nothing about this business, in my opinion, that's negative. We used to go to sheep, you know, we used to go to the county fairs and show sheep. It's not easy to load all your stuff up and go up to the fair and then spend all these hours uh, working with the sheep and um, fitting them. But I always had a crowd around me. Always a crowd of people who were like, wow, look at this, can I touch it? You know, and, and it's like, yes, you can. And you're your response back from people because it's something unique and something different is is worth a thousand words you know uh, it's amazing how doing this is such an unusual operation that people have given us many many accolades about it you know it's just um and, 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 and we really have, keeps you going right. that you have that and and we have our trials and tribulations every single day all the time but we've also we made that decision that we were going to do this, we we're going to make it work because of all of the background of the businesses that we've had right. and all the things that have just been mediocre. Everything in our life has been mediocre. 
So the lovely that we have something now that really means something to the people that are around us. It means something to us to project that. Um, and that's what, that's what and, keeps us going. And, and I can't underscore this enough. It's our friends that have pulled us through. Right. Our, our family did not they support we us when we first started this because everybody was like, what, is, what are you going to do? I mean, here you are at this point in time in your life, you're in your 50s. Isn't it time for you to sit back and do nothing, to take advantage of traveling and, and um, doing other things? You know, why do you want to get into something that's so difficult? It's going to wear down your body and wear down your soul, you know? And uh, we just said, because there's just something about, about this. We want to work at home. We have always wanted to have an on-farm business or a, a home business, and everything we've done has just been mediocre, it's just not worth it. This is something that's just so amazingly different positive. and so positive. It brings so much positive feedback to us that we just can't, you know, enjoy enough of it. It's just so wonderful right, to have right. that. And, and, and again, I can't, when I have a problem, I have great neighbors and great friends, and I'll just be having a bad hair day and want them to roll down the driveway. Yeah.